cells go through a constant cycle of rest, growth, and division. This PowerPoint, we're going to take a look at all the stages it goes through throughout its growth and division cycles. So the cell cycle con consists of two big time periods, interphase and cell division. In the cycle picture that I have down on the bottom, all of this purple arrow is showing the interphase time period, and this blue is showing the mitosis time period. And so it really does spend the majority of its time in interphase. And the, cycle, the cell cycle itself is an orderly set of stages from the first division, the actual mitosis area part of the cell cycle, and then it's preparing itself. It makes two daughter cells and then it prepares itself to grow again. Now, just prior to the next division, because everything in this M, the mitosis is the division itself. So what's happening during interphase, the cell is growing larger, the number of organelles are doubling, and the DNA is replicating because we need to double everything before we divide that cell in half. So there's a lot of things that are going on in interphase to prepare the cell to be able to divide in half. So it spends most of its time in this interphase part of the cell cycle. And it's performing all of its usual functions. It's eating, it's producing and breaking down sugars. It's, um, depending on what kind of cell it is, kind of depends on what is happening, but it's performing all of its usual functions. But then depending on the cell type, it's also preparing itself to undergo cell division. Now the time period that it hangs out in interphase really can vary by cell type. There are some cells in the human body that are reproducing and doubling quite quickly. There are other cells in our bodies that don't double or d replicate very, very slowly. So how long it spends in this interphase, it could be hours, it could be weeks, it could be months. It just varies quite a bit depending on what cell type it is. My note, not all cells do go through this cell cycle of growing and dividing. Nerve cells and muscle cells do not complete the cell cycle after development. And so when damage is done to the nerve and the muscle cells, that damage is permanent. It can't divide and make more cells. And so it stays in what's known as the G0 growth phase, which just means it's not preparing itself to divide. So it almost stays in this like permanent interphase. It doesn't go into the G1, it's not preparing to divide, it just stays in this constant state of you know, survival, but that's it. It's just maintaining itself. Now, if it is gonna go and start dividing as all the other cells in the body will, it goes through three different phases in interphase. We have a G1, an S, and a G2 phase. What's happening in G1 is a lot of just recovery and growth because it just got done dividing. The S phase is where we really start to see some of this new development and pre preparation for division. We start to have more organelles starting to get produced and we also start to see DNA starting to replicate because if you're gonna divide the cell in half, we need to make sure we duplicated everything. And so the S stands for synthesis. It's almost the making phase of interface. So we're making more organelles and we're making more DNA. We also then have the G2 phase. This is all, you know, the final growth that cells got to get larger before it can divide in half. We may need to start producing some proteins that are going to be necessary to divide the cell in half and kind of pull those two areas of the cell apart. So it's this last growth and final preparation before it actually divides. And then the cell cycle goes into cell division or mitosis. And the goal of mitosis is to produce two genetically identical cells. We are gonna duplicate DNA, we're gonna duplicate the organelles and we are going to divide them in half so they are genetically identical. Now the mitosis stage has a division of the nucleus and we have a division of the cytoplasm. Mitosis is specifically talking about division of the nucleus so that by the end of mitosis, we have two new or separate nucleus and each of them 
have the genetic, the same kind of DNA in each of them. However, they are still connected together. This is still technically one large cell. When the cell splits into actual two separate entities, then we call it cytokinesis. Cyto means cell, kinesis means moving, so it's almost the moving apart of the two cells. We've divided the cytoplasm, we've divided the cells into two. So first we're gonna divide the nucleus into two identical nuclei, then we're gonna divide the cell itself into, into uh, two separate cells. So both phases are necessary, but mitosis is more important and it has more things going on. But then, you know, what happens if something along the lines gets messed up? What if, just looking at this picture up on the top, what if uh, both of these orange chromosomes ended up on one side and two of the red both ended up on the other side? We wouldn't have two genetically identical offspring anymore. And so there are signals that are monitoring and checking and proofreading to make sure everything is happening when it should. So we've got different types of signals. They're gonna stimulate or inhibit different types of events from happening. They can increase or decrease the cell cycle. And so if something is happening that's not going according to plan, these different signals, these cyclins can stop the cell cycle. We can stop that cell division from happening. On occasion, we can actually go in and repair any damage. We can move chromosomes around if needed. Uh, otherwise, we just stop the cell from dividing so we don't end up with two incorrect cells. So we do have little checkpoints along the way to try to make sure that we are doing this whole, div this whole cell division correctly. Now the functions of why do we have this mitosis? Why do we have this growth and division? Well, most of it, it permits growth and repair. We need to be able to grow larger. We also need to be able to repair tissue. And in flowering plants, the different types of tissues retain this ability to divide throughout their entire life, which means they're gonna to continue to grow larger and larger and larger in plants. We as humans kind of grow to our optimal size teenage-ish years, uh, late teenage years, early 20s, and we're about as tall as we're gonna be. Uh, that doesn't mean, although we're not growing anymore, that doesn't mean we still don't need that repair from happening. Because we do still need that mitosis from happening to heal any cuts that we have, any broken bones, we need to be able to mend those, and we need those cells to divide to provide us correct undamaged cells. So we need mitosis when fertilized eggs become an embryo and then that embryo has to become a fetus and then we have all of the growth going from fetus all the way to an adult. And then from adult on, we need to make sure we can heal any kind of damaged tissue. Now there are some species out there that also use mitosis for asexual reproduction. Not all organisms out there have male parts or counterparts and female counterparts. And so all of their replication is through mitosis, that they are constantly making more copies of themselves. Uh, bacteria would be a very common example that can do that. It's not, there's not male bacteria and female bacteria, and they're looking to decide to have offspring. They are just constantly growing and dividing. Now the DNA that is found inside of the cells is very, very long, it's very thin, and it's very, very long, and it gets stretched out and intertwined between divisions. So when it's not doing anything, we see it more of this long, very skinny thread called chromatin. Now, when it does start to divide, that chromatin, this long, skinny, very skinny thread, does start to condense, it starts to uh, kind of curl up on itself or coil up on itself, and when it coils up enough, it coils up around various types of proteins called histone proteins, we can actually, when it condenses enough, it becomes visible. And we see this as what we now call a chromosome. So chromatin is the actual DNA, but it's not wound up, it's not condensed. We don't see it as a separate strand because it is so skinny. It's only when it's getting ready to divide that it coils up nice and tight and we see it as that chromosome. Now, in our bodies, we have two sets of chromosomes for each type. So humans have 23 types of chromosome. And if we notice, we have two of each. 
we've got two of the one set, you know, two of chromosome number one. We have two of chromosome number two, two of chromosome number three, all the way, all the way till we get to the end. Some of these are smaller, but we've got two of chromosome number 22. And then our last set of chromosomes are the sex chromosome. And depending if you're male or female, you're either going to have two X's or you'll have an XY. But we have two sets of chromosomes for each type. So we don't just have one of the one and one of the two. And so the fact that we have two sets of each chromosome is known as a diploid number. So we take whatever, how many sets or types of chromosomes we have, and if we've got double, it's our 2N or our diploid number. Since we have 23 types of chromosomes and two of each of them, we have a total of 46 chromosomes in each and every one of our cells. The only cells that do not have the 46 chromosomes the, so we call them haploid, are sperm and egg cells. They have half the number. They only have 23 chromosomes in each cell. And the idea for that is if eggs have 23 chromosomes and sperm have 23 chromosomes, when they come together, they form our complete diploid number so that we then have a pair of every set of chromosomes. Now, diploid has that DI in it, which means two. Haploid, I always think, sounds like haploid, so it's always half the number. Um, so it's whatever the diploid is, but it's half that. Now at the end of S phase, again, that's your synthesis phase, we're duplicating lots and lots of things. We should have two identical DNA chains at that point. Again, we had 46 chromosomes, but we need to duplicate that information. And your chromosomes, everyone always thinks a chromosome looks like an X. It really does when it's getting ready to divide. When it's not ready to divide, it just looks like one skinny thread. But when it's getting ready to divide, it has to duplicate. And so just looking at my light blue chromosome set number nine, each of these chromosomes is just one single thread. However, when it's getting ready to divide, each one of these would duplicate the information that's on there and each one of these would look like an X because it's now getting ready to divide. We've got to duplicate our information before we can separate it. Now, during mitosis, during the division, because we've got one set of chromosome, or one chromosome and there's its duplicate side, um, these two sets of information, we call them chromatids. I always think they sound like chromatids, but they're chromatids. So it is the chromosome information on one side, the chromosome information on the other side, and they're connected together at what's known as the centromere. It's in the center. Now during mitosis, that centromere is going to get cut in half, and one sister chromatid is going to go to one side, one sister chromatid is going to go to the other side, and each new cell is going to have a copy of this one particular chromosome. And so each becomes a daughter chromosome as they separate it, and they just get distributed to opposite daughter nuclei so that each new cell is going to have one set of this information. Now what's going to help pull those chromosomes apart? What's going to help pull and yank apart that centromere in half so that this left sister chromatid is going to go to one side of the cell and the right sister chromatid is going to go to the other side of the cell is we have spindles that yank these things apart. Now in animals, we have not technically an organelle, but it's similar to an organelle. It's a region in the cell and it contains two barrel shaped centrioles. These are organelles. These centrioles, I think they look a little bit like Twizzlers, but they are a microtubule organizing center. And they are gonna send out little spindle fibers and they are going to yank those chromosomes apart. They're going to yank those two sister chromatids apart as that cell is going to divide. Now the centrosome was also replicated in the S phase. Everything was getting duplicated in that S phase. So we will have two and they will start to migrate and move to the opposite sides of the cell. So you have a, a centrosome and inside of it you're going to have these little centrioles that send out these little spindle fibers on each side. The reason why they're on each side is that as each of them send out a spindle fiber, they're each going to connect to one sister chromatid and then they're going to yank them apart from each other. Now mitosis itself is broken down into four main phases, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase.
because there's so much going on in some of the phases themselves, some books will further break them down into early prophase, late prophase. So in this first one, because there is going a lot in prophase, I'm going to kind of put them all together, uh, everything that's happening in prophase. So it's in prophase, our chromosomes have been duplicated. The chromatin is condensed, which means you could actually visibly see this underneath the microscope. You can actually see inside the nucleus what looks like little tiny dark squiggles. You would not have seen that before this prophase has started. And the nucleus itself, that envelope, is actually starting to break apart. Because remember, we have to take the chromosomes that are in here and yank them apart. We've got to get that outer envelope out of the way. Now, late prophase, again, we kind of have early prophase, late prophase, but this is all still happening in prophase. The nucleolus that's found inside the nucleus disappears, and we can start to see that the chromosomes are all duplicated. They've condensed, they've doubled. Uh, we can see them as X's. The centrosomes have moved to the, are moving to, if they haven't already gotten there, to the outside edges of the cell. And we can start to see some of those spindle fibers that are starting to reach out and reach toward those centromeres of the chromosomes. So we've started to condense and we've started to see some of these chromosomes. The nuclear envelope has disappeared. Our centrosomes are moving to the outer edges of the cell because they're just getting ready to yank those chromosomes apart. Metaphase is those little chromosomes have aligned themselves, they've attached, those spindle fibers have attached to the chromosomes right at the centromere, and between the pulling and pushing of the spindle fibers from each side of the cell, they align those chromosomes right down the middle of the cell. And this is now when we know we've entered metaphase. And so metaphase is when we've aligned the chromosomes straight up and down, right down the middle of the cell. And we can actually see pictures of that and see the spindle fibers doing that. So I always think of in metaphase, they've all met in the middle. Anaphase, I think of as the sad phase because we are yanking those sister chromatids apart. So they were X's, they were those duplicate chromosomes, but those spindle fibers have started to yank them to opposite sides of the cell. So that you can kind of almost picture them waving to each other as if we yanked those chromosomes apart. Then we have what's known as telophase followed by cytokinesis. So telophase is almost a reverse of prophase. So what was happening in prophase, we have the reverse of it happening in telophase. So going back to prophase, in prophase, the nuclear envelope starts to break apart when we get rid of the nuclear envelope. Telophase, nuclear envelope reappears. Prophase, that nucleoli disappears. In telophase, the nucleoli reappears. And prophase, the chromosome, all that chromatin starts to condense and we can start to visually see chromosomes. By the end of telophase, they've started to uncondense and we can no longer see those chromosomes as little squiggles anymore. So they're kind of a reverse of each other. Now in telophase, by the end of telophase, we should have two distinct nuclei. So the end of telophase, we have two distinct nuclei. They each have their own set of chromosomes, but they are still connected to each other. It's not until you have the cytokinesis is when you actually break apart those cells into two different cells. So the cytokinesis is the splitting of the cytoplasm. Now in an animal cell, how it does that, it starts to form what's known as this cleavage furrow, that it starts to just constantly indent between the two cells until eventually it indents enough and it separates those cells into two. Animals or plant cells do it a little bit different. They don't have that distinct cleavage furrow to separate them. Instead, they start to develop and build what's known as a cell plate. And this is gonna have a lot of the cell wall material that's found in plant cells so that when the two cells are completely distinct, each one of them is still protected with new cell wall material on their outside. But what happens if we don't want our cells to divide anymore? What if we want to do the opposite? Instead of making new cells, what if we want to kill some cells? 
This is what's known as apoptosis. It's programmed cell death. Now I'm going to reiterate, it's programmed cell death. This is not just cells are randomly dying. These are cells that are programmed to die. Now when a cell dies, there are several things that are happening. The nucleus will start to break apart. You're going to have the plasma membrane starting to kind of blister and it forms these kind of breakdown blebs as they call it. And there's an enzyme known as caspase that really starts to help do this. Now it is an organized process of breaking apart these cells and the reason why it's so organized is that we really want to still contain anything that's inside the cell inside of cellular material. Reason for that, there are things inside the cell that if they just got released, our body's immune system would see that as a foreign material and it would start to go in overdrive and think that we are infected with something. So we kind of make sure all of the stuff that's inside the cell is protected until we can come around and engulf it and digest it and get rid of us. So mitosis and apoptosis are opposing forces because mitosis's main job is to grow and divide and increase cell number, whereas apoptosis's job is to decrease the cell number by programming those cells to die. Now there are other my mitotic functions and there is a particular type of cell that can do mitosis, but it's controlled a little bit different. And these are the stem cells. So virtually all cells in our body have the same amount of DNA and the same number of chromosomes, and they all came from stem cells that were activated. And there were different enzymes and different signals that told which cell is gonna become what kind of cell and allowed those cells to develop into those specific cells. Now there are still organs in our body that contain stem cells. These are cells, they retain the ability to grow and divide, and they can grow and divide and become different kinds of cells in the body. An example, in our red bone marrow, we have stem cells that depending on various signals can begin to divide and develop into different types of blood cells, different types of red blood cells or white blood cells. So there are stem cells that just depending on what information you tell it, can form different kinds of cells in the body. Now, where we can now start to use stem cells for our benefit is what's known as therapeutic cloning, is that we can actually start producing human tissue using adult stem cells or embryonic stem cells. So again, these are still stem cells, and depending on where we got them can kind of depend on how many different types of cells they can develop into but we can actually start to produce human tissues in labs now. We can grow tissues, which can be used for different types of tissue transplants, just by using adult stem cells or embryonic stem cells. Embryonic stem cells have the flexibility of developing into a broader number of types of cells. And so if we're trying to grow a large number of different types of cells, we would need to use an embryonic stem cell. If we're looking at a more narrow range of different types of cells that we're gonna grow, we can use adult stem cells. So for reproductive cloning, meaning the production of a brand new individual, you would need to use an embryonic stem cell. But there's not a lot of research going into that because there's a lot of ethical issues that go along with that as well. Now, what about bacteria? What about prokaryotic cells? So these are pro Prokaryotic cells, if you remember the difference between a eukaryotic and a prokaryotic cell, a eukaryotic cell, one of their big differences is that it has a nucleus, whereas a prokaryotic cell does not. And an example, a common example of a prokaryotic cell is the bacteria. So they don't have a nucleus, but they do still have DNA. And bacteria are constantly reproducing through what's known as mitosis. Now, I should say they reproduce through a process similar to mitosis. We call it binary fission. The idea is that it is constantly growing and dividing. It's just not quite as orderly and organized as the steps of mitosis, but it's still growing and dividing. Now, although bacteria do not have a nucleus, they still do have an area called a nucleoid region. And it's in that region that we find the DNA. The DNA in a prokaryotic cell, instead of a strand of DNA, that chromatin, it is circular, 
DNA. So the chromosome is actually a ring of DNA. It's very, very skinny. It's 1,000 times the length of the cell, but it's still a lot of DNA. Now, as they start to grow and divide, it's still going to duplicate that DNA. And so at the end of that duplication, they have two rings of DNA that are ready to split into two different cells. So they go through what's known as binary fission. It's still splitting the two cell, or it's still splitting one cell into two. The two chromosomes are that we just got done making are going to get distributed into those two daughter cells, and the daughter cells are identical to the original cell. It's asexual reproduction, which mitosis is in itself, is one cell becomes two cells and they are genetically identical to each other. Now there are some issues that can happen when we go through the cell cycle. So if something isn't happening correctly and we don't stop it from happening, we don't, our checkpoints failed at this point, this is when we can get cancer. So the cell cycle and cancer are tied to each other. If we have an abnormal growth of cells, we call it, can or we call it tu a tumor. Now there are two kinds of tumors. There are benign tumors and malignant tumors. And benign tumors are non-cancerous. So we have cells that were growing and dividing, growing and dividing, but those growing and dividing cells stay inside of a capsule. They don't invade neighboring tissue. They don't spread, which means they're easily able to be removed. A malignant tumor are cancerous tumors. They're not encapsulated. So as that tissue starts to grow and divide and grow and divide, some of those cells can break apart. They can move to new areas of the body and we constantly have these growing and dividing cells. Now usually what leads to a malignant tumor, there's usually some type of mutation in a gene that regulates the cell cycle. So we have lots of genes that are constantly making sure that we don't have any mutations in our DNA, we don't have any issues in our DNA before we start to reproduce new DNA. However, if there's a mutation in any of those genes and we don't have anything that's regulating and making sure that everything's correct, these cells are gonna divide and they're gonna divide with those mutations. Now these cancerous cells, because they have some type of mutation to them and they are constantly dividing and nothing's ever telling them to stop, they lack differentiation, meaning they're not gonna be specialized for any particular function. They're gonna be similar to each other, but yet without any purpose or focus. They're also immortal, meaning they're gonna constantly and continually divide because those checkpoints in the cell cycle are not stopping them from dividing. The nuclei may become enlarged. Again, these are abnormal cells that are just growing uncontrolled. They may have an abnormal number of chromosomes. They may have extra gene copies. These are not normal happy cells that can function and do whatever they're supposed to do. These are cells that are growing and dividing, growing and dividing, and they can't do anything. They're not specialized to do anything anymore because they have these mutations and abnormalities to them. And unfortunately, they are not programmed to die, so they don't go undergo apoptosis. Normally, cells with damaged DNA undergo apoptosis. So if cells have damaged DNA and we can't fix it, we target those cells to, to die so that they don't grow and divide. And the immune system should be able to recognize abnormal cells. It should be able to recognize that these cells are not normal and trigger apoptosis. And it's just not always successful. Sometimes our immune system can't recognize these abnormal cells or can't recognize such a large quantity of abnormal cells and trigger all of them for apoptosis. An interesting side note is the fact that the immune system can recognize abnormal cells and trigger them for apoptosis is one of our newest areas in cancer research and therapy is if we know that immune system cells can recognize cancer cells and get rid of them, well, let's see, you know, and for whatever reason, if you have cancer, that immune system cell couldn't do that. Well, let's see if we can find out why it couldn't and see if we can fix that part. Let's see if we can make sure your immune system cells do recognize those abnormal cells and do their job. So 
Cancer cells are abnormal, but they fail to undergo that apoptosis. So they're just constantly dividing. And as they are constantly dividing, if you notice, they all look a little bit different. Their nucleus is quite enlarged. This is when they start to grow and this abnormal constant growth develops into the tumors. Now, if it stays put, that's okay. That's your benign tumor. However, if it starts to grow large enough, if it can start to break apart, it may actually get inside blood vessels or lymphatic vessels and you have these cancerous cells that can travel to anywhere in the body. This is what's known as the metastasis. And so that tumor that's fragmenting and traveling and going to other areas of the body, and now we can have new tumors forming in other areas of the body. Some of these tumors can actually grow large enough that they need oxygen to get to this new tissue growth, they can actually trigger the formation of new blood vessels. It's known as angiogenesis. So just removing a tumor all by itself can actually be problematic if it's been in the body for long periods of time because these tumors can actually have blood vessels. And so cutting out a tumor means we have to be able to cut off and stop the blood from flowing through those blood vessels. Now, another kind of interesting factoid with cell division is that at the end of each chromosome, there are these little special materials called telomeres. And every time our cells divide, those little telomeres get just a tiny bit shorter. And when I say tiny, it's just a tiny bit shorter. So the cells can't divide at some point. They're gonna get too short, the cell can't divide. And this is when cells can start to die. This is where aging starts to happen. Our cells can only divide so many times based on how long that telomere is. And there was a video, and I've got a little, it's just under two minutes clip. I embedded it right here on, you know, if we know that the damage to those telomeres on the ends of our chromosome is actually causing enough damage to cause us to age, what if we could fix it? Maybe we could stop the aging process. And now eternal youth. Is it in a cage around the corner? News tonight of a breakthrough for some pioneering mice. But we always wonder, what does a fountain of youth for rodents reveal for humans? Here's Sharon Alfonsi reporting. Tremendous. In the movie Cocoon, it's a swimming pool that turns back the clock for a group of senior citizens. But now, researchers have found a way not just to stop, but reverse the aging process. The key is something called a telomere. We all have them. They're the tips or caps of your chromosome, seen here in yellow. This is what it looks like in a young adult. But as you grow older, the telomeres become damaged and frayed. And as they stop working, we start aging experiencing things like hearing and memory loss. Scientists took mice who were prematurely aged, added an enzyme, and essentially turned their telomeres back on. You can see it before the enzyme, after. Their brain function improved, their fertility was restored. It was a, a remarkable uh, reversal of the aging process. Look at this picture. The mouse on the right has bad skin, gray hair, and is balding. But the one on the left had its telomeres flipped back on. And you could see that uh, essentially you now have a dark coat color, uh, that the hair uh, is restored, that the coat has a nice healthy sheen to it. Even more dramatic, the change in brain size. This is before the mice had 75% of a normal brain, like a patient with severe Alzheimer's. But after the telomeres were reactivated, the brain returns to normal size. As for humans, while it is just one factor, scientists now say by looking at our blood cells and measuring those telomeres, you can get a better idea of how well you age. The longer the telomere, the better the chances for a more graceful aging. Sharon Alfonsi, ABC News, New York.